My name is Ilse Rus. I'm a professor at Rudy Gorka School of Law and um, I will give an online lecture on the EU institutions um, in specific today on the European Commission. So, let's get started. The uh, lecture today is part of um, recordings also done in the framework of uh, uh, the project that is now starting 2020 in Rigobertist School of Law, uh, which is uh, called uh, EU at RTSL, meaning that the teaching will promote innovative methods of teaching at uh, Rigobertist School of Law in field of European politics and EU law. My task today is uh, to introduce you uh, to the institutional framework uh, of the Union and to start with I would like to uh, open the Treaty of Lisbon which is uh, actually the most reliable source of information when you study um, on, or write papers on, uh, on the European politics. The institutional framework is actually a precondition of um, functioning uh, EU um, decision-making and uh, interinstitutional relationship and uh, um, the Treaty of Lisbon Article 13 provides insight on the institutional framework in which um, the institutions um, are promoting the values uh, of the EU um, they in interacting together advance the objectives um, and serve the interests um, of, um, of the member states, of citizens, and um, by doing so, and um, also important that uh, the institutions of the EU ensure the eff effectiveness and continuity of the politics uh, of the decision making in the EU. Um, according to the treaty, uh, the institutions shall be, and Article 13 now lists um, the following institutions, the European Parliament, uh, the European Council, the Council, please note, two different institutions, European Council and Council of the EU, uh, then the European Commission, uh, the Court of Justice, the European Central Bank and the Court of Auditors. So these are official institutions of the EU as to the treaty, Article 13. And I would like to attract your attention to some innovations that we see in the Lisbon Treaty framework with respect to institutions, which is that after the Lisbon Treaty was adopted, uh, the um, institutional framework became like overarching and not following the logics of three pillars as it was in the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, so now we are speaking about one single institutional framework. The second innovation is that the um, former treaties actually indicated as a legislating uh, body, which is the Council of the EU as a separate institution, but not European Council. Whereas um, after 2009, the European Council has gained additional powers and now is considered as an official institution of the Union and additional uh, lecture, online lecture, will be devoted on Council of the EU and European Council as two separate institutions having different ways of functioning, but also actually uh, the, the uniting aspect of, of these two are that in Council of the EU and the European Council, the governments, the national governments are represented. The third innovation of uh, the Lisbon Treaty, uh, which is indicated in Article 13, is actually that now, under the Treaty of Lisbon, the European Central Bank becomes an institution, a 
formally acknowledged institution, which was not the case in the treaties before. So, now let's have a look at how the institutions interact between themselves. And I think this is uh, something that uh, the scholars and also practitioners are very much um, engaged with is how to ensure the balance between the uh, different EU institutions. We know, as from Treaty Article 13, that they are carrying out their responsibilities to ensure the objectives of the EU. But the inter-institutional inter balance is not important only because we need just to keep all the institutions you know, on the level playing field, but that these institutions represent different entities in the EU. And let's speak about now who is represented by the Commission or whose interests the Commission represent. And here I have to, um, uh, you, you know, the slide follows with the uh, explanation that establishment of European coal and steel community um, was a project of six founding member states. And at that moment, uh, the idea of supranational institutions that would present general interest of all the um, participating parties at that time, six member states, would have a kind of supranational role. Uh, at that time, this overarching institution of supranational body was called high authority, but the principle is the same, so that the Commission is representing the general interest of the EU, not the interest of South or West uh, or single countries, large or small, but the overall interest, the general interest of the EU. And it is also said that the Commission is friend of small countries and um, I can only agree uh, to the extent that uh, the the fact that Commission balances the general interests and doesn't allow the major players uh, to dominate. Um, so at least there is an agreement um, that because of impartial nature about the, also the uh, rights of initiative of the Commission, there is agreement that uh, the mechanisms are in place uh, to, in, to, uh, to introduce, to implement this uh, approach of uh, a playing um, interest of all countries. It also has to be pointed out at this um, stage that the Commission is garden of treaties. So the Commission has a role to follow whether the countries implement, whether the countries follow the primacy of EU law, and uh, so it has also this monitoring function. We will speak about this later, but now let's get to the next player of this triangle, which is Council of the EU, is representing interests of member states' governments. Here are 27 member states' governments. And it may happen that in, during negotiations, during legislative process, uh, the interests of these governments are diverging, so we have kind of like-minded coalitions in decision-making process, um, uh, but uh, each uh, country uh, is represented in the Council through its government, um, which um, also means that the, um, uh, the, the balancing interests of like intergovernmental angle, so intergovernmental country to country interplay versus supranational powers. Here the Commission and the European Parliament. Finally, let's go to the European Parliament and whose interests are presented there. And in the European Parliament the most important angle is that we are speaking about ideologies, about political groups, ideological groups. 
Um, so not uh, about member states, but rather like transnational approach of uh, liberal views or green ideologies uh, or socialist approaches. So um, again, an online lecture will be devoted to a European Parliament and uh, these different uh, political families, ideologies, uh, groups uh, here. And uh, uh, it's important to note uh, that here under European Parliament, all people, all 500 million inhabitants, citizens in Europe, uh, would be represented across political families. So meaning that the um, supporters of EPP, European People's Party, in Latvia, in Malta, in Germany, or in Estonia, uh, would then be represented uh, in, in the same way, but not across the go governments, not across national member states. Before starting to speak specifically about the European Commission, I want to stop uh, studying Article 5 of the Treaty of Functioning of the EU. The Treaty of Functioning of the EU is just another name of Lisbon Treaty. So under the Article 5, uh, we define actually what would be the powers of the European Union versus the powers of member states. And this is a very important principle that is defined in Article 5 as principle of conferral. And principle of conferral actually says that the Union shall act only within the limits of the competences conferred upon it by the member states in the treaties and that competences that are not conferred upon the Union in the treaties remain with the Member States. So here this distinction is very important, in particular when we speak about different kinds of competences, exclusive, shared, coordinated, supported. So meaning that not in every field, not in every policy, the EU has powers to react and, and this power is only through the treaty revision step by step um, throughout integration, throughout many treaty changes. So policy fields are included under the um, competences that then are become the EU competences. So uh, the principle also here stresses that the member states remain masters of the game in many fields. And this is a very important aspect to, to remember. When the EU has powers to act, or other words, when the EU has competence to execute its power, uh, the Union is allowed or expected to adopt legal acts. And this is again defined by the Lisbon Treaty. The Lisbon Treaty, Article 289, as follows. The ordinary legislative procedure shall consist in the joint adoption of the European Parliament and the Council, and then on the proposal from the Commission. So this is a very important article of the Lisbon Treaty. I would call it like a legislative article because it shows for the first that in the European legislative work there are two chambers of legislation. The, like chamber, if we can consider it as a chamber, the member states' governments coming together in council will be one of the chambers, the other chamber direct, directly elected European Parliament and they jointly acting 
In previous treaties it was called co-decision. Now the uh, Lisbon Treaty uses the term ordinary legislative procedure, in particular also just to stress that this is, you know, the default way of decision making, ordinary legislative procedure. But also this article points out that the Commission has power to come up with the proposed legislative draft, so on the proposal from the Commission. We will see that this has some exceptions, but um, the article 289 explained in an easy way in my next uh, slide show that actually Commission has the right of initiative, he coming up with a proposal, and then two legislators Council and the European Parliament jointly acting in ordinary legislative procedure, Article 289, would decide jointly on the legal acts. So, legislative function, once completed, the legal acts are translated into national languages, which is the language of application, so not the English translation of the law, but Latvian, Estonian, German, and so on, the member states, according to uh, this legally binding translation of, uh, of the legal proposals, it becomes a binding law because of, there is a principle of primacy of law in the EU and then the Commission starts its monitoring function, so meaning that the implementation of the legal acts, um, we will speak about different types of these legal instruments and also some differences, how these um, become binding. But uh, the Commission has then the monitoring function, so the Commission becomes a watchdog or some kind of monitor uh, to, uh, to see how the Member States follow the implementation, so this is also executive power of the Commission as a supranational institution. And we also have a European Court of Justice here as an actor, um, so to check the compliance uh, of the implementation of uh, of the EU um, legal acts. So we started to speak about competencies. So because of the principle of conferral, the EU can legislate only in the fields where EU is assigned this role. So how is this role assigned, and how can we know uh, whether the EU, for example, can um, be like a leading and a leading uh, partner or leading uh, institution for um, different fields of uh, policy, let's say like transport, uh, health policy, foreign policy um, or, or economic monetary union, in which of, uh, of the uh, mentioned uh, the EU has exclusive power to operate. So uh, again, uh, this is um, uh, easiest way to, to get the answer is just to check the treaty. And I always recommend um, uh, the students and participants of the courses to consult uh, the reader-friendly uh, option, the reader-friendly version of Lisbon Treaty. Uh, you can easily find it, just Google Consolidated uh, Reader-Friendly Lisbon Treaty. And um, this is a very helpful tool, uh, because this very complex legal reading is also explained in an easy, understandable uh, way. And um, let's have a look on uh, three patterns of competencies as defined in Article 2 to 6 by the Treaty. So there are three types. The EU can either have exclusive competence, it can have shared competence, and it can have supported, coordinated competence. What does it mean? And how can we get the answer to the question whether, for example, pension policy uh, uh, would be decided by EU or by member states, or health, or monetary union. So again, consulting now the treaty. I have opened now Article 2. 
of the reader-friendly version of Lisbon Treaty. And here you see that Article 3, um, here the legal text and also the easy read text. Uh, but what Article 2 says that there are three competence categories and uh, the first exclusive competence would mean that when the treaties confer on the Union exclusive competence, only the Union may legislate. So, whenever we have exclusive competence, only Union may legislate by adopting legally binding acts. In these cases, Member States can only legislate after EU permission. So, meaning that here the EU has a leading power of setting rules or legislating. So the second category of competences is so-called shared competences. Again, Article 2 explains what the shared competence is. And it said that when treaties confer on the Union a competence shared with the Member States, and this is again in specific areas, the Union and the Member States may legislate and adopt legal acts in the area. But here is an important distinction, which means that the Member States shall exercise their competence to the extent that the Union has not exercised its competence. So, this is a very important aspect. So, shared competence is not meaning that we would decide 50-50, like Member States and EU. But here it says that the Member States may legislate until the Union decides a law. And once the Union has started deciding a law, then Member States have to refrain. And here we have to remember that in um, one of the basic principles of, of functioning of the Union is the subsidiarity principle, meaning that we will come to this definition, but in general this article is very much about the subsidiarity, so that whatever can be solved on member states level have to be solved on national member states level, and what can be and must be jointly then focused or solved, then it's up to EU. But once EU starts, the member states are not any longer advised to take a lead. Well, finally, there is a third category of competences, which is coordinated and supporting action. And here we are speaking about measures, and it is again Article 2, uh, subparagraph 5. In certain areas, under the conditions laid down by the treaty, the Union shall have competence to carry out its actions to support, coordinate or supplement the action of the Member States without thereby superseding their competence in these areas. So, what does it mean for a practitioner that if the competence is supported, coordinated, there's no harmonization of EU law and these measures are then better dealt on the national level and EU can just say, set a guidance, kind of benchmarking, coordinating action uh, or, or, or by soft law deciding or defining the, the vision um, where this policy in future would go. And to summarize now it all in a table, as Article Functioning of European Union uh, gives us the three competencies, exclusive, shared and competence to support and coordinate, we see that in the first group, for example, uh, we have such policy fields as customs union, uh, we have uh, trade, uh, we have monetary policy for Eurozone, which is quite obvious that these are the fields where EU-only action is taking place as an exclusive competence. 
Uh, of course, member states are giving mandate, but we have also to, um, uh, to remember, as for example in trade policy, that the supranational uh, institutions, having received this mandate from the member states, will then negotiate on behalf of member states with the third party. So, exclusive competence would mean that uh, no member state uh, would actually set up own trade deals uh, where uh, the EU competence is in place. Uh, as an example of shared competence, I think a very, um, uh, very often we are speaking about harmonization of law, environment, agriculture, transport, energy. So, very typical community matters uh, issues where the community method is in place, strong um, action of supranational uh, com commission proposal role, uh, European Parliament and Council acting together, and in many cases shared competence also um, uh, in cases where the shared competence is applied, we see also application of qualified majority voting uh, as a voting rule in the Council. So these uh, shared competence uh, policy fields uh, would be the consequence of single European Act when um, um, a lot of attention has been to set up an internal market, uh, to set up well-functioning rules uh, and harmonization of law as, you know, as a way forward. And finally, such policy fields as culture, education, human health. These are policy fields where member states play a major leading role and that EU has just a comp complementary role of coordinating, supporting this action. Uh, we've seen also during Covid crisis some limitations of this division of competences because Commission, as also stated by the uh, State of Union speech uh, uh, by the President of the Commission that actually the lack of competence of uh, the European Commission in this field was leading uh, to, to, to some kind of difficulties to handle with the, uh, first, uh, by, by first reactions from the Union side on the Covid crisis. Um, but uh, the competence issue is set in the treaty and uh, Unless the treaty is changed, uh, it's quite difficult to imagine that these rules uh, can be changed so that uh, this is um, kind of the um, framework within which uh, the uh, EU has powers to act. So, how can we know as practitioners or scholars when necessary on um, on the basis of which rules, on the basis of which procedures, the EU will act. Uh, whether this will be ordinary legislative procedure, as set in Article 289, or it is a special legislative procedure, whether Council will vote on unanim by unanimity, or Council will vote by qualified majority voting. So how can uh, can we, as practitioners, without participating in negotiations or just picking up phone, calling someone in, in the um, um, institutions in Brussels, how can we know uh, what rules are applied? And um, here we have to speak about uh, the term legal basis. So what legal basis means? So legal basis actually is the... Um, the um, uh, reference to one of the articles in the treaties that uh, allows us to judge uh, what method will be used and which will be the power of institutions uh, while exercising this task. So whether there will be competencies of the Commission or rather this will be major um, competence by the Member States. So. Um, here I would like to introduce um, the slide uh, saying that for the first uh, that you always can find prime, the, the uh, reference to the legal basis in, um, in, in primary law, in primary legislation, in the treaties. And, um, and then uh, the treaties will tell, there will be always um, in the um, legislative act 
the reference in which regulations, directives or decisions uh, will lead you uh, to which, which um, uh, provision of the article is applied. Um, so, how can we know uh, which kind of uh, legal act is uh, in place and uh, uh, what are the effect of uh, the different uh, five types of legal instruments? Are they binding? Uh, or are they just recommendations for the member states? So, again, uh, we are very much helped by treaty. It's Article 289 that will define uh, under Lisbon Treaty now five types of legal instruments. Regulations that are binding, so the member states have to um, implement them directly, so they have direct effect, so after translating into the language, uh, so it applies to this country uh, directly, uh, after publishing it in um, uh, the official journal um, of the EU. So the second uh, legally binding instrument is a directive, and directive uh, differs from regulation to the extent that it leaves the member states some choice uh, when applying it. So there is a transposition into national law. Uh, it has some also come some time. Member states are given time to transpose a legal act into national law, but also it gives member states a bit of flexibility how the legally binding European uh, legal instrument is implemented into national law, transposed into national law. Finally, the third binding instrument has a binding effect, is decision. And decision is binding for the um, aim or the scope of its action. Let's say there is decision on fishery quotas in the Baltic Sea. So then not Austria, not Malta will be bound by this decision. Um, or there is decision which is uh, um, attached to very concrete action. Decision to implement the European External Action Service, for example, decision of 2010, so that it will define how the external action service is formed and, and, and what are the conditions um, uh, under which this will function. So these are three instruments that are legally binding, regulation, directive, decision. Whereas others under Lisbon Treaty recommendations and opinions, they would be instruments of soft law. And then we have um, also category that is politically binding, at which is very strong instrument because also it is decided um, by unanimity, meaning that each country can veto it, and these are council conclusions. This is instrument very much applied to European Council decisions, also to foreign policy, so where the, um, the political um, also aspect is in place. I have here also to point out to two uh, other um, articles that are just following uh, after Article 289. So, we have in the Lisbon Treaty the new, um, you know, no, new approach for comitology, as previously explained, uh, that also in some uh, exceptional cases, Commission can become a legislator. So, when the Commission becomes a legislator, is defined un under Article 290 and 291, it is possible that the legislators as the Council of the EU and the European Parliament jointly will adopt the basic act. So, the basic act, which will be the politically um, adopted uh, instrument of the legal instrument of the EU action. But this basic act may delegate powers to the Commission further to agree on either some technical details or on 
aspects of implementation. And these are then the activities under Article 290 and 291 when the Commission gets legislative powers under delegated acts and implemented acts. There is much discussion about, again, power of balance once the Commission is actually given the right to legislate. Uh, there has been even um, some years ago the intergovernmental agreement adopted just to set the rules how, uh, how to deal with these acts and not, um, you know, um, without any uh, restriction, allow the, uh, also the, some um, important aspects of legislative work penetrating into the delegated and implemented acts. So I think this deserves a separate lecture. I will now go, not, not go into the details of delegated acts, but it is very important uh, to remember that under this non-legislative act, action or the action of the Commission um, implementing um, and delegating powers, uh, there is uh, the whole world opening uh, to be discussed. Now, um, when you will um, see the slides of this presentation, um, I would like you also to ask you just to go through some practical tasks uh, to get acquainted with the um, database of uh, legal documents in the EU, which is uh, the database of eurlexeurope.eu. And um, under this database, it's easy to find um, uh, both the primary law, secondary law, um, the legal instrument that we've just discussed, directives, regulations, decisions, there is a very advanced search function and um, uh, you can uh, train yourself by following the link that I have put here for you uh, as an example a directive of, um, uh, on copyright and related rights in the digital single market and try to find legal basis, try to find legal basis un under which this directive is adopted in 2019 and um, then published um, in official journal. So what kind of procedure is used? And to answer and to help you with this task, I have now also put in um, my slides uh, this directive and if you open it, you will see that actually the first sentence of the directive will state that having regard to Treaty of Functioning of Europe, in particular Article 53, Article 62 and 114. So, now you have actually to open treaty again and search for these articles. What are these articles saying about the procedure with respect to decision making? And Article 53 guides you uh, to actually solution saying that in this case European Parliament and Council shall act in accordance with ordinary legislative procedure, meaning that they will be co-legislating. And um, Article 114 uh, will again explain the ordinary legislative procedure and because of the, um, uh, this provision being part of the internal market, it also explains that decisions in the internal market will be decided by qualified majority. So actually, the legal basis has given you answer to how the acts are adopted and how uh, the institutions interact with each other. So, now let us change the um, topic from the overarching institutional framework, interaction, legal basis and the legislative um, procedure to the role of the Commission. So, the Commission is the institution, one of uh, the formal institutions under Article 13 and uh, it has um, several functions and several principles and the main, I listed six of them, the principles of the European Commission are independence, monopoly of initiative, executive role of the Commission, 
dialogue with the civil society, also policy planning or agenda setting, and also external representation. So, after having listed this, let's go through some of them. When we speak about independence of the Commission, I would like to ask you a question. Do you think that a minister from X member state could lobby the commissioner of this particular country with regard to, to national interests? Well, the treaty says, Article 245, that the member states shall respect commissioners' independence. So this actually focuses on the member state responsibility to respect the commission's independence. On the commission side, the commission swear an oath on independence. And in my slides, I have included the video of the EU president Sorry, the president of the Commission, Mr. von Leyen, uh, on behalf of College of Commissioners, taking oath in Luxembourg. So this oath is given before the European Court of Justice. So please watch the video and see also the differences between the supranational institution here, the Commission, and state if the similar oath would be actually uh, swear in, in the court of, of a state. The next principle, the monopoly of initiative. So Article 17 addresses this issue and says that legislative acts may be adopted only on the basis of the Commission proposal. So it is default that only. But then article continue, you know, continues by saying, except when the treaties provide otherwise. It's quite a quite a familiar you know, formulation in the treaty that it also gives some kind of flexibility for uh, some exceptions. And here we have this exception for that, for example, for the field of common foreign security policy, where uh, the um, for the first, not always legislative acts. So I would say that legislative acts is not a, a, the instrument for foreign policy, but the proposals in the field of foreign policy um, come from the member states or a high representative or a high representative supported by the Commission. But here, the monopoly of initiative mainly applies to uh, to the um, um, community method of uh, lawmaking in in the EU. So in the next slide you uh, see that the um, Commission uh, has right of initiative uh, which starts actually by public consultations. And uh, the first process of consultations may even take uh, a year or two, uh, depending of course uh, of, of the, the objectives of this uh, legal um, uh, act to be uh, envisaged. Uh, but then the um, uh, Commission has um, task to draft the legal uh, proposal and then once it undergone all these phases, then the com Commission College, so meaning all 27 Commissioners together, would vote in College so that to balance also the uh, different policy fields, imagine like climate, where there would be many interests in, in one policy field, so that the College is kind of standing behind uh, as, an, as, a, um, as a unity uh, behind this uh, Commission proposal. Let me now uh, give you two um, new aspects of uh, green papers and white papers. So the green papers is a process of um, um, stimulating a discussion between uh, public uh, and civil society uh, meaning that before the Commission comes up uh, with the legal act, in many cases uh, the broader discussion in society is necessary. So for this reason there is in place a mechanism of creating green papers um, and um, this is um, actually enhancing the debate 
that can result in outlining white papers. So, some examples of green papers. Mobility of health. So, the proposal of mobile health, 2014, green paper on this issue. Then, for example, on building of Capital Markets Union 2015, again, a green paper in this field. So, the white paper is an, the next following step after the green papers, uh, where the Commission no, not only focuses on broader discussion, but already focuses on action, which is needed in this specific uh, area. And for this purpose, by launching the white paper, the Commission engages in debate also with stakeholders like European Parliament and the Council of the EU. So they need to have a political consensus when they start legislating new instruments or, or several like several legal acts uh, in enhancing one policy field. Just example here, um, there was uh, 2012 um, and white paper on safe and sustainable agenda of a pension system. I think everyone knows the uh, broad discussion and white paper of the Commission on uh, uh, reflection of and uh, scenarios of um, future of Europe, EU 27. So where the EU should go um, by 2025. So these are some examples of white papers and um, so green papers, white papers that actually trigger the discussions both among um, society but among also stakeholders in, in the EU. So, principle of subsidiarity has been mentioned already in this uh, lecture, but the principle of subs subsidiarity also is important uh, for triggering that the Commission will not exceed its powers once it's starting uh, legislating on uh, specific uh, issues. So, um, it's always um, important to stress the agenda setter role of uh, the European Commission. And um, you can best see it uh, during the change of legislative cycles, because the term of the Commission is five years. And um, uh, I think the most expected annual event that would expose also the future priorities, annual priorities, but also so, to some extent you can see the long-term priorities um, in the State of Union speech by the Commission President every year. So um, I have uh, given to you also here the insight of um, agenda setting powers by the recent Commission, a State of Union speech uh, of 2020. Please open the link, follow the speech, one hour together with the Commission President, there will be a lot of discoveries uh, for you, where the Commission is heading uh, for the coming year. So, it's important also to stress that EU, uh, the European Commission has an, an external representation role, but only to the extent that the Lisbon Treaty now assigns a new um, approach and Article 47, which possibly is one of the shortest articles of the treaty, says that the Union shall have legal personality. So this also shows that now, as from 2009, not the Commission has only the external representation power, not the high representative as under the Treaty of um, Amsterdam in the field of foreign security policy. Now EU has joined one single legal personality. So under this scope uh, there is also the powers that the Commission and external representation powers of the Commission. And my next slide asks you the question who is this man? So of course we see here the high representative Vice President of the Commission President, who is currently a High Representative of and Vice President of the Commission, uh, Mr. Borrell, and uh, he has.
has a double catted position, meaning that on one side, uh, commission high represent sorry, the high representative um, represents foreign security policy with respect to the foreign policy and defense policy, where the council and external action service plays a strong role. On the other hand, as a vice president of the commission, also um, Mr. Borrell now has a lot of powers in external policies and interacts with other commissioners, being the vice president of the commission. Uh, so these fields are development policy, humanitarian aid, neighborhood policy, um, also partially trade when interacting with the trade commissioner, uh, and why not climate? So here commission interacts with external action service and council. So being as a double-hatted position, it also strengthens the relationship between the institutions, but also consistency of policy making in external relations. And it is very much differs now from uh, the previous treaties where the presidency had a role to play before 2009, when the foreign minister of the uh, presidency state has powers to external representation. The commission now has five years uh, and there is um, the new commission um, in, in place um, with uh, also strong um, aspect of gender balance and, and uh, the um, fields where the Commission specifically is working as a team are um, actually six of them. In the next slide you will see the list of these priority fields where the Commission acts as a, um, as a strong leader, not only internally, but also externally as a, a leader uh, in, in the global world. So here um, the um, Commission setting this uh, together in one Commission College as, as uh, the um, now um, assigned uh, these tasks to, to the Commissioners. Um, you see also uh, three um, executive vice presidents um, of um, the Commission President. Um, then uh, they being Margareta Westhager, Franz Timmermans, uh, Valdis Dombrovskis, and uh, you can follow also um, other portfolios here under this slide, study uh, how this uh, is interrelated to the priorities that I just explained, that there are um, some uh, fields where the Commission acts in, in clusters, so they act jointly, several commissioners together. The Commission is to some extent uh, comparable with the member states' governments as executive. Remember, it has supranational nature, but executive power of the Commission makes it like similar in terms of its organization. So it has commissioners, 27 commissioners. Uh, they, each of the commissioners has a cabinet, so the, the office that actually changes with the commissioner, uh, may change and changes. And then the Commission has a so-called DGs, Director Generals, Directorates. And under these directorates there are divisions. So together uh, this would um, frame the, the bureaucracy, the uh, executive powers of, of the Commission. So now allow me to uh, spend some uh, um, slides and explanations also for how the Commission is Pointed. This is always a very discussed aspect every fifth year. So the recent Commission um, uh, nomination uh, was um, not a surprise, but it was uh, quite complex. Uh, because the Treaty of Lisbon actually defines that the nomination or election of the Commission President has to take into account the outcome of the recent Parliament elections. It is, in other words, we know this principle as a um, pattern of Spitzenkandidat. So what, what is the procedure of Spitzenkandidat? So it means that uh, the European Council, European Council, which heads of states together, propose 
a candidate, they actually they vote on it. Uh, the formal voting procedures qualify majority voting, but these kind of decisions are always taken on consensus basis. And then um, this um, nominee for the Commission President uh, is offered to the European Parliament and the European Parliament then decides, uh, decides on it um, and if absolute majority of members of European Parliament which uh, uh, support, then he or she is elected. So 2019, this pattern did not follow exactly uh, this um, um, Spitten candidate um, pattern. Um, so it was, um, at least the intention was to take into account European Parliament election outcome. At the end, it was very difficult to find the compromise within the European Council and it didn't turn out to be exactly following uh, this logic. Uh, so, uh, we do have uh, the president of the commission from the largest political group that gained, gained uh, uh, the most votes in the parliament elections, which is European People's Party, but not exactly the Spitzenkandidat logic was followed, um, which means that you can read um, uh, article of treaty differently, and I think that the European Parliament reads it differently from the Council. So. Appointment of the commissioners, not the commission president, but the commissioners, follows uh, the um, following steps. The member states appoint their candidates. Uh, it is up to the member states. There is no like overarching general pattern or rule. This is up to member states to get there. So once the appointee is, um, is um, there as a commission, a commissioner of the specific member state, then the president, uh, the president of the commission designates portfolios to all the uh, commissioners and then they have to undergo hearings uh, before the European Parliament committees um, and once this is in place uh, so that uh, there are all the parliament uh, committees have listened to uh, designated uh, commissioners for their tasks. It may be a lengthy procedure where the, a lot of discussion is devoted to objectives of five years term, but also to specific aspects of the uh, nominee uh, candidature um, or background. So um, it, it, it may happen that uh, the countries have to replace their nominees if the parliament rejects uh, after the hearing. It has happened also recently under 2019 hearings. But then uh, once the new commission is uh, more or less in place, the European parliament will take a vote on the whole college as such, as a whole. So this is defined by article uh, 17. Um, and uh, so following this, the procedure of consent is used by the Parliament on the forthcoming commission, commission College for the five years term. So uh, in my next slide I offer you also a link to the hearings, a small video, um, that these hearings actually is um, very well attended, at least before Covid time, by the European Parliament uh, members a lot of interest uh, for the um, institution commission uh, where the vision will be how the commission is going to implement their uh, mandate. Now uh, let's uh, come to some practicalities. Commission staff. So it's there are discussions that the commission has uh, uh, there's a huge bureaucracy, too many um, people working for the commission I think here we have to remember that the Commission is representing institution um, that um, has executive powers of 500 million people in Europe. So compared to the um, administrative burden of the member states, I think the, the share is still very relevant. Uh, there are 32,000 uh, permanent staff members um, and um, uh, they uh, build up, uh, about two-thirds of total staff of EU institutions. So, uh, working in the Commission uh, is, is um, 
quite uh, among other institutions is, is quite quite a large share uh, uh, of the employees of uh, of, of these uh, um, um, European uh, jobs. Here, um, just the data from uh, 2020 uh, division across distribution across the member states. How many employees per member state are employed in the Commission? Uh, there is quite an um, um, kind of quite a balance, gender balance, uh, with 55% of women working in the uh, Commission bureaucracy. Please carefully study also um, the age pattern of the Commission personnel. And finally, I would like to encourage uh, also participants of this course, if you are um, studying, if you are um, looking uh, also at possibilities for traineeships, Please use the possibility of uh, commission uh, traineeships, uh, internships, so-called Blue Book traineeship. Blue Book traineeship is um, opened for um, um, uh, for applicants uh, twice a year, on 1st of March and 1st of October. The traineeship for half a year would start. Um, it's quite competitive. Um, it requires also, you know, um, not only your academic excellence, uh, but also engagement and ability uh, to network, uh, to be ready to, to uh, engage also uh, with civil servants in, uh, in um, um, reaching out. Uh, so uh, use this, um, follow the website, uh, learn about uh, how to apply um, and possibly with time you will become one of um, EU uh, administrative staff members of contracts or um, of temporary staff agents in the EU Commission. And finally I want to devote uh, some words on, uh, uh, on the executive powers of the Commission, meaning that uh, in many cases, during the um, consultation process, during also um, implementation of law, um, the Commission comes up with different um, res research um, uh, deliverables uh, with impact assessments, uh, with statistics. Um, so, in order to be able to evaluate the need of uh, engagement in legislative work or um, the effect uh, what uh, this would leave for, for the uh, concrete policy field, uh, they have to carry out uh, different studies. So there is um, an agent that the Commission is, uh, gets a lot of help from and these are the so-called Commission agencies. So there are a number of specialized, decentralized EU agencies um, almost in every single European member state. Uh, there is an agency of the Commission and, uh, and these um, agencies actually um, are tasked by the Commission um, to provide uh, legal assistance, to provide technical um, or scientific um, uh, project assistance uh, to the Commission. So this is a pool of expertise that the Commission has. I have also inserted the link to the uh, agency's website. Uh, please uh, follow the link. See also the agencies across the capitals of the EU, possibly there are agencies where your competence is needed uh, or where you can gain also data for your work uh, from these agencies as a very reliable source of information um, provided actually by, by very, very, very professional staff members um, of, of these Commission satellites. This is the end of my lecture on the Commission. And I welcome you to follow uh, the upcoming online lectures on the Council and the European Council, as well as the lecture on European Parliament and the lecture of European integration.
I thank you.